yes, we are absolutely looking at specific markets abroad. We've looked at this with our legal teams on where the best places are to recruit. I think we all get a flavour for now how Kieran wants to play the game. That's not going to change. We're not going to lump it. We're not going to smash it. And we will be relentless in the pursuit of rebuilding your amazing football club. That's not a sales pitch. That's fact. We'll get things right. We'll get things wrong. But I promise you, our work ethic and energy that we put into this football club will be unrivaled. Friends, and you are my friends, and welcome to another very special Talk To You presentation from Talking Town, the fans' platform for a bit biased, but the greatest football team on God's green earth. I am, of course, your host, The Gov. I'm here to look pretty today and make sure questions are what you have asked. The Ko-Fi and YouTube members who have put their questions forward, thank you for that, and thank you for your support throughout the year. I'm joined by these two wonderful gentlemen, diehard town fans, through thick, through thin, Rich and Matt. Welcome. How are we both this morning? Yeah, we're very, very excited. excited. Yeah, excited. Yeah, looking good, forward to good. it. Good, good. So obviously this is a man you hear through the press throughout the year, but he's finally going to meet hard truth face to face with you two. Um, I know you've got some questions, obviously, about the year. Are you ready just to get stuck in? I know the time is is precious. So I bring in our chief executive. Are you both ready? Go for it. Good man. Right, here we go. So joining us live, in case you, you didn't know, in case you didn't know from the artwork, is the chief executive of Richardstown Football Club, Mr. Mark Ashton. Good morning, Mr. Ashton. Mark, how are you? How are we, guys? We good? I'm very well, yeah. thank you. Yeah. How was that for an interview for Town TV? Was that all right? Uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. I've got to tell you, I love the artwork behind you. Who's done that? Good man. I'm glad. I'll, I'll pay you later. His name is George. George Nunn. Uh, he's a very, very good. He does all of our stuff and uh, he is phenomenal. Um, good. Matt, I know you want to kick things off with sort of the elephant yeah. in the room, so I'll, yeah. I'll hand it over to you. Just go go for it. We'll go straight there, Mark. So season's done and dusted. 46 games done. Now, as a fan myself, disappointed where we finished. I know that's probably going to echo right through inside the club but can you tell me what your thoughts are now the season's done and you know we we finished below where we expected yeah i think i think where we finished is absolutely frustrating um 100 i would have hoped and expected us to be higher um in finishing in the table but i think the pleasing thing for me are the performances um and a lot of the games we haven't been far away um, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, if you look at this football club consistently over the last three years in this division, it's been a similar type of finish and a similar type of, of points accumulation. And we've got to be far better. The club's got to be far better. Um, but it does take a little bit of time. And as I've said time and time again, this is a far bigger club than I initially thought when I came here. And there is far more work to do than I initially thought. So, yeah, frustrated, I think, is the key word, um, but very, very optimistic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Rich? Do you, think, do you think, in hindsight, Mark, that 19 signings was a little bit too many? Because next season, are we looking to get our business done early? You know, we're going to Loughborough. Will we have the squad together, fully cooked, ready to go? Because I think if we look back, we were sort of making signings up to when Sam Morsey signed right on, the, I think it was the last day of the window, and we... We all had that the word, didn't we? Gelling. Let me break the question down into two parts. Any chief executive who tells you he's going to have all his team ready for the start of the season, ready at the start of a pre-season tour, is telling you lies. Doesn't work like that. Because the transfer window goes on into the season mm -hmm. and things happen and things move. I would love to have this team all together, this squad together, for the first day of pre-season. Um, but that just doesn't happen. It's just, it's just timing in the industry. Clubs won't release players till certain dates until they've got one in. So whilst that is a utopian position, it's not realistic. Um, 19 players in, 20 plus out, um, of course it's too many. Um, that's not sustainable. Um, but, you know, when, when Paul was here quite a few months before me, I only joined on the 1st of June. You've got to remember that. So I came into a transfer window that was in some ways underway. Um, there was no recruitment department at the football club whatsoever. And there hadn't been for a period of time. 
So there was an element here that we were always going to have to over recruit and go at, in, at times quality rather, sorry, quantity rather than quality. You know, just the law of averages, we knew and I knew that all those players wouldn't work out. But yeah. we were where we were at that point and hence we did what we did. Um, but gelling that many of players at once is, is, is never going to be easy. Um, but it's, it's where we were, it's what we inherited. And, you know, I, I would, I'd hope it'd be calmer this summer. I guess it's really rare for any chief executive to come into a, almost a blank bit of paper of a football club in that terms. Then no recruitment department, you know, seasons of underachieving. It's just, I don't think, have you ever experienced a situation where it is literally a blank bit of paper as you're just sort of describing? It's never, it's never, it's, it's never a blank piece of paper. Um, there, the, you know, I'd, I would love to be able to tell the support as everything that I've found when I've come in here and what a real day in my life consists of, because I, I just think they'd find it intriguing. You guys know we, we can't do that. Absolutely. Um, of course not. But, but it wasn't a, a blank piece of paper, um, but it was, you know, one of the things I think in fairness to Paul Cook that he was right about when he spoke to me in the very early days was this football club needed to hit a mighty reset button. Um, and it had underachieved uh, and has underachieved for a number of years. You can't sort that out in one transfer window. You can't. Um, but we had to hit a reset button. Some of that, that recruitment was always going to be risky. We knew that. Um, but I go back to it. We, we, where we, we were where we were and we had to deal with it. Um, and I think what you've seen in the second part of the season, particularly with Kieran, is the importance of consistency. Trusting the process, trusting the identity, sticking to a plan. And, you know, whilst we didn't get enough points in the second half of the season, I think if you if we'd have just had an average start in those first eight to ten games, we'd have been right in contention. Are we going to get more seeds like this, Mark? That's what I want to know. <laughs> not, not if you speak. I got in so much trouble with my missus over that. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story. I got home after that game. I think, firstly, I thought that was... Leaving Bristol, joining Ipswich, 19 in, 23 out. A whole first eight games of emotion just came out. And the fans, I'm so grateful to them because they were just incredible. And it all just it all just came out. Um, Still got the marks from that bear rug you gave me and Colin. Oh, we were like, he was grabbing out <laughs> of everyone, guys. You, you wouldn't <laughs> believe the messages I was getting from players I've worked, worked with 20 years ago, Bristol players, et cetera, et cetera, saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> Um, likes, and when likes. I got home, my missus was stood on the doorstep. I'm still buzzing because we've won. And she's looking really cross at me and really stern. And she said, show up straight away. We're in the middle of COVID. Disinfect yourself. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, my daughter, my daughter, my 13 year old daughter, Evie, thought it was fantastic. Um, we went to have a breakfast on the Sunday morning and there was a big queue. And she said, don't worry, Dad. I'm going to tell him you're a TikTok sensation. <laughs> How, how is it going to work with recruitment for the summer then, Mark? So presumably there's a list of targets. Is it a case of your team identifying people or Ken, uh, McKenna also, Kieran McKenna also involved in that? Uh, how, what's the kind of the dialogue that happens? Show us the that dashboard. Keep trying, keep trying. Um, <laughs> look, it's, it's a group effort. I, I've said this time and time again. I don't do talent ID. I don't select the players. We've got Sam Williams, who's joined us from Manchester United, um, who's a real coup to head up recruitment. Um, we've got uh, data analysts and scouts that sit underneath um, Sam. Um, they work with um, Kieran, Martin, Rennie Gill Martin, Charlie Turnbull, etc. Um, and they've had in-depth debates on how Kieran wants to play next season, the identity of the squad and the individual profiling. They then go and recruit to those profiles. That group then reports to me um, almost on a daily basis um, in a window with the targets. My job with Luke Waren is then we action on those targets. Luke and I don't do the talent ID. I keep saying this, we, we just don't. Um, and again, no player comes into the football club unless Kieran McKenna wants them to. So there's a collective, there's an analytical approach, and it's a balance between the objective and the subjective with the scouting and the data. Um, and Kieran understands that. He likes that approach. Um, uh, but it's a team. It's very much a team. So how far reaching is our scouting network like? Do, do we go abroad, Mark, now? Or has Brexit affected sort of 
the scouting and looking at looking abroad because we had Romeo Zondervan on the platform and he was on about Dutch players coming to town. And he said it's a li little bit more difficult now, obviously, with uh, the rules of Brexit. Um, yes, we, we absolutely are looking abroad, but you have to be more targeted in the locations that you look abroad because you need to understand um, the entry point system. There's no point scouting areas where you know, even if you identify the play, you can't get them in. Um, so, yes, we are absolutely looking at specific markets abroad. Um, those, again, I think I said this uh, historically, we've, we've looked at this with our legal teams on where the best places are to recruit. Um, when you bring players in from uh, overseas, though, you've got to have your club, your training ground, your staff has to be set up. The culture has to be set up for that. Um, Martin Pert is key on that. He speaks several languages. He's well-travelled. He's coached and managed overseas um, because I've made that mistake historically where you've brought an overseas player in and they just haven't settled. So you've got to have that whole lifestyle piece boxed off for their family. But absolutely, we we are looking in specific overseas markets too. Something you did at Bristol City, wasn't it? Where you you, you, you brought some French players in with yeah. you. Um, so it's not something you've you've not done before. So it's... No, and, and, and I think you, you're naive if you don't think this is a global market now. Um but I think it's where Ipswich is slightly different. I think if you go to specific overseas players and talk about League One, I'm not sure they will come. But when you explain it's Ipswich and the size of this football club and the history and the tradition of this football club, adding to that Kieran McKenna and his background and his reputation, it does open up new markets to us for sure. That's, uh, that's a nice little segue into this question from one of our contributors, Mark, Tom James. I'd be keen to know what Mark has learned about not only the club, but himself in the past 12 months. What would he do differently, if anything? And what has he? What have you been inspired by to put in place for next season? I think the first part, what have I learned about myself? I've learned I'm certainly getting older. Um, and I've got a lot more grey hairs. Um, <laughs> it's, it's been a fantastic first 10, 11 months for me personally. Um, I, I, I'm honestly, I'm so re-energized. Um, I'm excited for every, every single day that, 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 that comes along here because I just see the size of the opportunity. Um, I think, as I've said, I keep saying this, I think I underestimated A, the size of the football club um, and the size of the opportunity ahead of us. Um, but I also underestimated the amount of work that needed to be done. Um, and if you ask me what I would do differently, I would have pushed the change process harder and quicker. Um, and I'd have probably been a little bit more ruthless in that. And ruthless isn't a word I like to use, but hmm. I, the size of the club, the amount of change that is required on and off the pitch, if you don't push it quicker and quickly and hard, you won't go forward quick enough to beat your competitors, you'll end up going backwards. Um, yeah. and, and I think that when you've got 26,000 plus people in here for the last game of the season when there's nothing on it, I think yeah. that tells you everything you need to know about this football club. The demands okay. and the expectations are high and we've got to match that with the work rate and we've got to match that with the rate of change. Absolutely. So you said, yeah. said 26,000. That um, segues nicely into... Um, Season ticket sales, Mark. How are we doing? Because I, I, when I went to the dinner at Milsom, you said we'd sold nearly um, 15,000. I think we were nearly hitting. Yeah, we more or less bang on 15,000. Um, it's been wow. fantastic. Um, we'll go into the second phase of marketing and promotions for that shortly. Um, and, I, you know, I can't thank the supporters enough. They've been truly, truly wonderful. But come on, we can do more. Let, let's, let's, let's really do something special here. Um, you know... I, I just think the opportunity is huge. We've got to deliver on the pitch, but equally we've got to deliver off the pitch. Um, I'm sure you've got some questions about that. Um, fans have been fantastic. Season tick, ticket uptake has been fantastic, but I want to keep that going. And I just ask the fans to, to keep buying the tickets in volume. So what yeah. about the away away membership? Because um, it's obviously gold card at the minute. I know they have you have your ultimate. Because yep. demand away, listen, look, you, you, you were at MK when we went there. Me and Matt were there. Look, we took 7,000 there. Yeah, we were there. Is there going to be any sort of change to the system? Because tickets are going to be massively in demand next season away from home. Because some of these stadiums, like we go to Forest Green, we're probably only going to get 1,000 tickets there. So is there any way, like a point system, or are you going to stick to sort of 
what you've got at the minute with the ultimate and the gold card? Um, there's, there's no plans to remove the gold card right now. Um, but th what this links to is a raft of projects that are taking place on and on and off the pitch. So um, I'll give you, a, if I, yeah, I'll give you a couple of exclusives on this. So we've got two new staff members um, joined and or joining the football club. Um, we have, we have appointed Stuart Cox um, as our director of venue. Um, Stuart joined last week. Don't hold it against him, but he joined from the club in yellow up the road. Um, he's a very experienced operator. He will now run the venue. Um, he will be in charge of bringing the catering in-house, um, sorting out kiosks, beer, food, uh, events, concerts, etc. Very, very experienced op operator. It is a big addition to our team. Um, and we have just appointed uh, a director of marketing who will also be joining us in the next four to six weeks. Um, I can't give you their name because they're at another football club at the moment, um, but we're delighted that they'll be joining us and there'll be two senior members of staff who will be looking at the points reward, the stadium entry systems, hospitality in uh, the concourse and commercial areas because we, we need to up our game. Um, and, you know, four and a half thousand people in a fan zone uh, when we started with probably around 11, 1200 at the start of the season is yeah. incredible. But we've got to match that with the service, the facilities, the experience. There's no point in us doing incredible numbers in ticketing and bringing in first time families to the football club and not giving them a good experience. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day. We can't do all this overnight. You've seen the building work start at the stadium. We're onto it, but there's a hell of a lot to do. Um, and we're bringing in people with different experience and skill sets to help take us forward. Does, does a lot of that kind of match day experience, Mark, and the catering, obviously that goes hand in hand with American sports. Does a lot of that come down from the, the game changer guys in Arizona? No, not at all. Not okay. at all. Just my philosophy. It's my model. Yeah. I have a specific model of how we operate. Um, um, in saying that, the guys in the US... Um, are always pushing us on on excellence and quality, um, yeah. you know, whether that's on the pitch or off the pitch. Um, you know, they just push and push me to drive standards higher and higher. But it's not something that's specific to them. Um, they're just supportive in, in pushing us forward in all areas. It is a nightmare to get a beer, so if I sit in the uh, Magnus stand at half time. Have you ever thought about, like, you know, out on the practice pitch there, you, you've got your mobile people. Like, you go to a concert, don't you, Matt, and they're coming around and they'll pour your beer at them. Have you thought yeah, about that? Yeah. Well, you'll be aware. We listen. The, the bizarre thing in this country is we can't do that in the auditorium because of the legal rules. If you go to rugby, you can. Yeah. Um, I do think that's probably something that we need to look at as an industry. Um, yeah. But Stuart, who's joined us, he's a real expert, and he's going to be looking at all of these different things to increase speed of service, give better quality uh, value to money for the supporters. But it's going to take a bit of time. On, on, honestly, if, if I walked you around the stadium and showed you all the areas, you can see a lot of it, but you can't see all of it. You know, we've got uh, facilities that haven't been opened in years because the roofs are leaking. It's not in equipped. Yeah. It, oh, dear. Yeah. It goes on and on and on. So it, it's, it's a li little bit like painting a huge bridge. By the time you get to the end of it, you've got to start again. Oh, yeah. um, but we have a huge to-do list in the operations <laughs> team and both here and the training ground, um, they're on it. How so what's your vision for the stadium then? For the next five, ten years, what, in an ideal world, what, what is your vision? Because that was the question we had from Thomas. What is your vision for the stadium for the next five, I ten I think years? a facility that operates 324 hours a day, 365 days a year. You can't have a facility of this size, this magnitude, in this location, in the town centre, that only operates when our first team play. Um, so we've got to upgrade all, if you like, our commercial and event space facilities. Um, I'd like us to, one of the reasons that we're taking the corner out is it will allow us to put a new modern pitch in with a new modern pitch. We can then look at concerts. We can look at multi-use of the stadium. Mm -hmm. So from a commercial perspective, I want to and need to drive revenues 365 days a year. But I want, I think more importantly, I want to give us a home that we're really proud of. That first day I joined the football club in June last year, when I, I couldn't believe how dirty the stadium was, how unloved it was. Um, and we just to get that first game on, by the way, was a challenge uh, from a facilities perspective. So, yeah, a home that everyone's really proud of. 
um, and it operates well, it's smooth and it's slick. Um, and I think pride is something that's a word that's really important to me. Is there any um, plans to bring in any safe standing areas? Because there's a lot of teams sort of around the country have, have got that now. Because like you look at the, the Bobby Robson stand, most people might stand in there for the full 90 minutes. Is there any plans to bring in sort of some safe standing areas in that stand? It's something we're looking at now. We've had a couple of conversations with um, the Football League and with the Safety Advisory Group. Um, one of the challenges we've got is the balance between what we offer home fans. We have to offer certain things to away fans. Um, so that gives us some challenges. You know, you guys have been to the stadium. The stadium is not really... It, there hasn't been a plan, a, a, an estate strategy to how the stadium runs and work. It's all been bolted together. Um, so I, I personally, I'm a supporter of safe standing. Um, and it's something I would really like us to try and, if you like, test or trial at Portman Road. Um, but I'm also going to be honest with you, it's not the top, top of my list. It is on the list. And it's something we're looking at very seriously, but we've got other infrastructure projects we've, we've got to get done first. Is can we ask? Because Martin sits in the Cobalt stand, he sat there for years. Would that yeah. be one of the stands that you knock down? Not imminently, no. Um, I don't okay. think there's, there's, there's. I don't think there's um, a commercial model that makes sense to do that right now. I think as we move through the leagues, we're looking at different. Um, uh, plans on what we can and can't do with it in the short term, the lifespan of certain parts of the structure. Um, but I think, look, if you were ever going to increase capacity of the stadium substantially, that's the natural, the natural rebuild. Um, and I think there are things that we can do to that stand to make it far more effective in the medium term. But if you were saying to me long term, how are you going to increase numbers in that stadium? Well, that's the natural place for redevelopment. Yeah. You mentioned you've got a list of infrastructure projects. We saw a little bit of a glimpse of one on the last day of the year when we had the unofficial opening of Town TV, if you like. What, what's that list look like? What's the, the first couple of items on the infrastructure list? And You've got, you've got all day. Oh, I've got, I've got as much long time as you want to give me. But well, is Town TV the, the imminent one? Listen, if, you, if, you, if you've got all day, get your paintbrush and come and give us a hand, boys. I tell you, because we've got, we got some work to do. No problem. Um, there half hour. Um, <laughs> I won't be. I won't really. Uh, Town TV comes in two stages. Um, so Town TV um, won't officially be launched until this time next season. Um, we're giving notice on uh, the, the iFollow platform to the EFL. We've got one more year contracted on that. Um, and we will uh, bring in our own commentary team um, because that's really, really important to us. Uh, I think we're heading to a place where Glenn Wheeler will, will head that next season. Um, BBC will still carry on with, with, with what they want to do. That, that's absolutely their prerogative. Um, but it's an important step for us. And I, I've got, it's really interesting, this is. Um, you'll be aware I was out in the US with the, the owners. Um, we watched the Wigan game. It's not You don't get a true representation of the game. Um, and it really bothered me um, because I, I, I called a couple of my staff after the game and thought didn't think we played particularly well. Didn't think there was any atmosphere in the stadium. And they were all like, Mark, you can't be serious. It's been a really good night. The fans have been rocking. Yeah. The team have played yeah. well. Mm -hmm. And the problem is it's a single camera feed. Yeah. So we're talking to the EFL at the moment about multi-camera feeds, how we can put microphones around the stadium so we can capture the real atmosphere at Portman Road. Um, and, it, and it's a project that I think is really, really important to us because then that links to fan zone, potential big screens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but officially, we can't launch it fully for 12 months because of the, the iFollow contract. So, so that will run when it does. Stream. Sorry, oh, Rich. When it does run, Radio Suffolk will still be able to do... Because I've got a load of questions on on possibly Radio Suffolk not being able to, as you no, can imagine. No, no, no. No? Well, no, no, they can, they can absolutely, under the BBC's agreement, they can, can continue to run their commentary. No problems with that at all. Perfect, thank you. Sorry, we've got town fans all over the world, Mark. What about um, streaming passes for? I've got the question here from uh, a guy called Chris who lives in Australia. Yeah, and he said in the seventeen eighteen season you could get a season pass for it was like about two hundred dollars. Uh, he said prices have gone up, but will that be something they can you're going to look to to do moving forward? I, th I think this is really important. Supporters remember this. There's a little thing called Article Forty Eight, and Article Forty Eight is a UEFA rule. And that states, thou shall not broadcast at three o'clock on a Saturday. You can't do it. 
None of the clubs can do it. We can broadcast midweek games and displaced games if the game's changed. So no, no matter how much we kick and scream, it's not an EFL, it's not an EPL, it's not an FA decision, it's a UEFA decision. And that is something that's set in stone if you like to protect 3 p.m. On, on a Saturday. But what we will be doing is we'll be looking at a multitude of passes for supporters um, to watch those games on town TV with our own commentary, a real build-up show that will be on the big screen, will potentially be in the fan zone, uh, will be in the concourses, on the TVs in the concourses, in the commercial areas, etc. Et Perfect. Great question. You mentioned the meeting in the US. As you can imagine, I had a lot of questions asking me to ask you what went down. Well, how was it perceived? I know you're not going to say exactly what happened, but give us a little bit of a... Of Wouldn't a you like to know? Oh, I would. Absolutely, <laughs> I would. Absolutely. Um, you know what? It was um, It was a busy week. I was out there for four or five days. Um, um, I think I've only just recovered from the jet lag, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> Um, added to that, the guys out there, the meetings start at 5.30 a.m. in the morning. Um, it's, yeah, no, the, the, it was great. Um, I've spent a lot of time on Zoom with, with Mark Steed, um, uh, who's PSPRS. Um, and it was great to finally get some, spend some proper time with him in detailed meetings on, you know, the finances, the football club, the budgets, the plan. And he's heard this so many times on Zoom. But it was nice for each other, for us both to see the whites of each other's eyes. Um, and it was a fa fantastic, fantastic meeting. Good time spent discussing where we are, how we improve, um, where the opportunities lie. Um, Ed Schwartz was there. Mark Detmer was there. Um, and then Burke joined us. And, and I went across to see a Phoenix game. Um, and it was 98 degrees. Um, <laughs> and it was melting. Um, but it was great. It was great. And, and I listen, I have to say this. One thing I have to say is the uh, the investors and owners and shareholders are, are just absolutely superb. Mark Steed, Ed Schwartz uh, are absolutely fantastic. The Three Lions uh, are very supportive. Um, and I'm really grateful to have them, uh, along with Mike O'Leary, um, who I don't think gets the plaudits he deserves at times because Mike sits quietly behind the scenes. Gives me a hard time. Trust, trust, trust me on that. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it, it's good people who want to take your amazing football club forward. Yeah. I think we said before, I mean, Matt. He he reminds me and Matt of Patrick Cobbold. You yeah, know, he's Cobbold, that, yeah. That older. Yeah. Sort of, he's like he's like your grandfather, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's sort I, of I, I, I've I've known Mike for twenty years, um, and I have total respect for him. Um, and it's good for me because as a CEO, you know, you, you need someone on your shoulder as a CEO, making sure the checks and balances are in place. At yeah. times, you'll tell me to slow down. At times, he'll say, no, push forward, go quicker. He's, he's a really good sounding board. And he's been a CEO of a Premier League football club. Um, he's a very, very smart individual and he's a key, key player for us. We can't, we can't let you go, Mark, without asking. As you can see behind Rich, he's got all the planet blue behind him. What's the latest with the new strip? When, when can the fans expect those? Um, imminently, I think we've got a stream of really good, positive news stories to come out um, around kit. Again, more infrastructure products, uh, projects. Sorry, we're going in. We're in it. In essence, we're in a transfer window. That, that information and knowledge will start to come out. Um, we can't. I can't tell you now because I'll be, I'll be breaching commercial agreements. What yeah. I would say to the fans is, I think some really exciting stuff. There's been a lot of things going on behind the scenes, and I just can't wait for us to start start to talk to the fans more and more about it. Is the contract with Adidas finished, Mark? Again, I'd love to tell you that. I'll get myself. <laughs> I, I will get myself in the club in a world of trouble. Just That's watch sick. this space. Trust me. It'll You're be worth to America, me. Martin. He was talking about Mark Steed. Oh, I want to ask you a question. Who's got the best beard, you or Mark Steed? Oh, Mark Steed, for sure. <laughs> yeah, thanks for being here. Mark Steed, for sure. Um, I know time is, is, is running out on us. Um, you're all, guys, keep going. You're all right. You're all right for a bit. Don't worry. A couple of questions I've still got in mind, one of which is, obviously, a lot of discussion over the last couple of weeks about pathway for younger players, academy players. Uh, academy is something that this football club holds dear, particularly the fans, um, and they love to see one of their own come, come through. Uh, squad size? wants to work with the smaller squad, bigger squad. What's the situation in terms of the pathway for a, a Humphreys, for example, just to pick a name out of, out of the book? Um, 
listen, it's it's a good it's a good question. It's a, and by the way, every football club I've worked at, every set of fans value and and care about the academy, and they want to see their own in the first team. I just want wins. I'll be honest. I just want wins. That's all I care about. Thank you. Who gets them? <laughs> look, look you're, talk, you're talking to someone who a very long time ago was a product of the then academy system. Oh, yeah. um, so you're not going to find anyone who believes in it more than me. Um, Gary Probert's the same. If you look at our record at Bristol and the players we brought it's into really that good. first team, it was pretty damn good. Really um, good. You know, I get asked the question, um, you know, what age are they, uh, uh, are they, are they, are they good enough? Um you know, my first, I'm showing my age here, but my first coach at West Brom was Nobby Styles, And as a World yeah. Cup winner, he said to me, if they're good enough, they're old enough. Um, but let's be really clear. I, it'd be, I, I couldn't tell you on, on, on the individuals whether they're good enough or not, because I don't of watch course. them train enough, I don't watch them play enough. There's only one person in this football club who will decide when that time is right, and that's Kieran McKenna. Absolutely. Um, very probate, and the team will make sure the pathway is in place. Um, and if they're good enough, they'll be old enough. But Kieran will will decide. Um, could I just talk? Do you mind if I just talk to you something about that for a second? Go for it. Well, I think Go this is really important. Um, one of the things I think I've learned in my career, and I've thought about this a lot at Ipswich, and I've talked to Kieran a lot about it. What I think you're going to see next year's season is a very, very clear identity that this football club has. And look, and whilst Kieran McKenna is absolutely key to that identity, it has to be a club identity because it has to run from under nines in academy right the way through to first team. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, you know, I think we all get a flavour for now how Kieran wants to play the game. That's not going to change. We're not going to lump it. We're not going to smash it. We're going to do it our way. And I'd ask the supporters to really get behind that and believe in the process. Um, Kieran is nobody's fault. He is a smart cookie. Uh, and when you talk to his coaching staff, they, they talk a similar language. And I, what I want to encourage the fans to do is believe. Because I have this frustration in, in, in life where a lot of people will say to you, um, yeah, 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 but seeing is believing. I'm not like that. I am different. For me, believing is seeing. And I think we've got to believe in the way Kieran wants to do this. And we've got to get behind it. And at times, things will go wrong. But we've got to stick to, stick to our guns and say, no, that's what we do. We are going to develop players through. We are going to have an identity right through to the first team. And whilst Kieran is smart enough to flex that identity, to win games, be under no illusion, it's really important that that club identity shines through. And everybody... From the gate man to the CEO to the coaching staff to the backroom staff to you guys and the fans, we all understand what our identity is. Because I think if we have that, we then have the opportunity for consistency where we're not signing 19 players every transfer window. We can bring the players through from the academy. We can recruit one or two to uh, enhance us. But that identity piece is really, really, really important. And I hope you don't mind me saying that, but I just it's really? something I'm quite passionate about for us. Yeah, no. absolutely fantastic to hear that, Mark. And, and just quickly going back to Kieran before we, we run out of time, was it, were you nervous about appointing him? I'm going to say, you, I'm sure you weren't, but the fact, you know, he hadn't managed a club before, young manager coming through, been at United, obviously. What did you see out of him in the interview process that you thought, this is the fit for us? Um, I think if you look at my history in recruiting managers, um. Boothroyd, Rogers, um, Mackay, Appleton, Johnson, all right, second time out. They're all young, up and coming in, in, in their career. And I think I've said this before, we ran a really detailed process. Uh, I interviewed seven or eight and they were really good. But I just, it's, it's, it's really, I just didn't feel it. Um, and I spoken to a number of the former players um, who were outstanding um, Matty Holland, Simon Milton, others. And I asked them to help educate me on the history of the football club, on the fan base, what the fans expect, the type of football they want to see. And whilst they want winning football, we also, we are in the entertainment business and we want people to have, enjoy, enjoy good quality football. And I think it was Ed Schwartz, in fairness to him, who, who said to me on a call, look, you just, 
you, you don't seem over happy, Mark, um, with the names that you're presenting to us. Why don't you go back to what you've done in the past? And my worry was that was this football club too big? 29,000 for Sunderland. Was that too much history, pressure, tradition, expectation on a young manager's soul, yeah. shoulders? I track Kieran, as I do. As, as that's my job, to track young up and, co and coaches for a number of years. And when I met him, I promise you, within a minute, I got it. You just, you just felt it. You felt the comp. He got this. He knew what he wanted to deliver. And I think we had a moment in time with probably where he was in his career at United and some of the change process that they were going through. I think three months earlier, we wouldn't have got him. Um, and who's to say three months later, we wouldn't have got him. But we had a moment in time. And the best way I can describe it is there was a meeting of minds. on the, And we talked initially not so much about the technical stuff on the pitch, but about values um, and how we wanted to see this football club develop, the behaviours, the actions uh, in which we wanted to, again, see the club develop and move forward. And he ticked, he ticked all the boxes. Look, when you did your football homework, there's no, that bit didn't worry me at all. But this is a big football club. Yeah, he's a big football, you know, uh, video junkie watcher. He likes to, to to watch plenty of football. I'm sure he's up on his stats, which I'm sure is coming across into the recruitment room with the dashboard. Do you do pre pre assists, Mark? Is that a, is that a stat that you track? The the. <laughs> There is umpteen stats that they they they, uh, they track. Um, I, I've got to tell you that the data that's in the game now is is incredible. But there's no point having this data unless you have smart, intelligent people who can understand that data and you know make make it work. Um, the players understand it, and the players almost demand now that level uh, of, of coaching. Um, so yeah. He does. He likes his data, but he will tell you himself. He won't make his decisions based on data. He, that is just simply part of the process. He'll look at scouting. He'll look at data. He'll look at performance data. He'll spend time talking to the players, uh, the, the mental health coach, and he puts it all all into to his decision making process. And then he'll make the decision. Nice. Nice. Um, anything else before we sort of wrap I'm up? With, with Mark, Mark, you know, you've been at a football club um, just over a year. How do you get away from it? How do you spend your downtime? Because this must be, it's got to be 24 seven, just consumes you daily. Listen, there is no, there is no downtime. Um, it's a, it's not a job. It's a way of life. I have a very understanding family. Um, um, I've done this for a long time. They've seen the strains and stresses, the highs and the lows that this brings. And it has to be a commitment. Um, Kieran's the same. He's exactly the same. Martin Pert's the same. L Luke Waring's the same. Anyone who works with me will understand that I am demanding. Um, I'm not particularly proud of it, but I'm not good with a work-home life balance. Um, I work, work, work. And listen, one thing I would say to the fans is I can't ever promise you success, but I can promise you work rate and commitment. And we will be relentless in the pursuit of rebuilding your amazing football club. That's not a sales pitch. That's fact. We'll get things right. We'll get things wrong. But I promise you, our work ethic and energy that we put into this football club will be unrivaled. Wow. I was going to ask if you had a message for the fans, but I think that's an absolute perfect message um, for them. The, the only question we've got left, which is what we ask all of our guests, and it's a really important question. It's probably the biggest question we could ask you, actually. Uh, and that's Jaffa Cakes. Is it a cake or a biscuit? <laughs> One, I don't eat them, so I wouldn't know. But it's got cake in the name. It's got to be a cake. This is it. That's it's okay, it's in the biscuit aisle. In the biscuit, though, isn't it? in the biscuit aisle, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Treat yourself to a packet. Absolutely. Treat yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, love it. Absolutely love the last uh, 38 minutes. Mark, I'm, I'm sorry we've, we've run over. Don't but worry. I really appreciate your, your time um, and your commitment to the football club. And Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. I am one of those people. I, I am in the show me, don't tell me phase of it. And I'm looking forward to seeing everything that you've, you've brought to the to the table coming off because it's going to be an exciting time for if just town fans isn't it we, listen we've got to believe Think, things won't run smoothly i'd like to say we're gonna have a perfect straight line to the premier league it never happens there'll be ups there'll be downs we'll win when we don't expect to we'll lose when we don't expect to but we, we have to do it together and we've got to move to this belief stage where we actually believe that this football club 
We're not Ipswich. It's not going to go wrong again. Oh, just because we haven't scored in the first 20 minutes, there's going to be anxiety. Guys, we've got an outstanding young coach. We've got people who are working really hard for this football club. Personally, um, whilst it's been a year that's ended in frustration, I think we've made huge advances both on and off the pitch. I can't thank the supporters enough for this. Thank you to you guys because, you know, you're really passionate about this. And, you know, I don't expect you to be evangelising about us all the time. When we get things wrong, you're going to tell us. That's fine. Um, but I promise the supporters we will be tireless in our efforts to rebuild this amazing football club because it is truly amazing. And we're signing Burst, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> he tries, doesn't he? He keeps trying. <laughs> that bit won't make it, I promise you. But <laughs> I just thought I'd get it in at the end. <laughs> there we go. Mark Ashton, ladies and gentlemen. What a, what a fantastic 35 minutes plus. Rich, Matt, how are you feeling now as we as we sign off? He's very, he's very engaging. He's a great salesman. I'll give him that, Matt. You know, he, look, he talks brilliant. But like he just it's said, there, he, <laughs> he doesn't give himself a day off. No. You know, it's this is his life. And like he said, he'll get things right and he'll get things wrong. And it's just... That's just yeah. like, like we, we can't be expect everyone to be perfect all the time. But he's got our club at heart, and I think we will get to where we want to want to go. Because, like he said, I think he is relentless. Definitely, Matt. Absolutely, and it, it made me think back to when we did those interviews with the Americans. You know, this time last year, just the total transparency of it, which we never got under Evans, and I keep saying it. We didn't know what the guy looked like for ten years. The total transparency there, you know, and if there was information there that he could share with us. I think he would have done. Look, we've got two yeah. exclusives there on who's joining the club in terms of behind the scene infrastructure. So just fantastic. And, you know, you, you can't argue with the work ethic they're bringing. Whether or not they can bring success on the pitch, it's up to other people. But in terms of what they're doing behind the pitch and to make it football road great for everybody that attends and loves this club, wherever you are in the globe, what, brilliant. What absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I, think, I think he's correct there. When you asked him about, we said about last season, about the 19 signings, like, I think we've said it on here before, Matt. When you sign that amount of players... You know that they're not all going to be a success, and it was it was it was needs yeah. must I think wasn't it? With a massive clear out that they had, they had to get that number of players in. But yeah. listen, it's going to be an exciting summer going forward, and hopefully we can get some good signings in, and then we've yeah. got to hit the ground running. We've got Absolutely. to hit the ground running the thirtieth of July. Plenty to look and forward we'll, to. Lots of things. Yeah, lots to look forward to, and we'll be there every step of the way. And as we said in the interview, we're not going to be the PR company for the football club will hold them to account they may not get it right they may not get it wrong but we'll still hold them to account and hopefully we did you guys and girls at home justice today and we did you proud and the questions you you wanted asked were put forward um and a huge thank you to our to our patrons our ko-fi and youtube members thank you for putting us in this position as always and you can become one by following the link but uh yeah i'm looking forward to the season now i'm ready to go let's let's rock let's roll um ready to see what 20 goal season striker brings in um because he wants more than 15,000. That's just the start. You get the feeling from him. So it's going to be yeah. a good good summer of coming up. But until then, keep your eyes out for more Talking Town content, more specials. Marvellous May isn't over yet, I don't think. And uh, we'll, we'll be checking back in very soon. Take care.